Hello, everyone, and welcome to Event Icons, where you get to chat with the icons of the event industry. I'm Brant Kruger, and January is National Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Month. And it's one of those issues that can seem nearly insurmountable uh, for us to solve. Uh, but today, we're going to be talking with Michelle Gelbart from ECPAT USA about what we can do in our industry to at least help slow it down. So we'll be talking about that in just one moment. It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons, presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Use the question panel on the webinar to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter, submit your questions with hashtag event icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Dot com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons. All right, so let's dive into this incredibly uh, difficult and tough topic. Thank you so much for joining us today, Michelle Gelbart. You are the Director of Private Sector Engagement for ECPAT USA, a nonprofit organization that works with uh, works to end uh, the sex trafficking of children. So, Michelle, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about what is ECPAT? Hi, so thank you so much for having me. Um, so ECPAT USA is a policy advocacy organization and our mission is to end the commercial sexual exploitation of children. We do that through raising awareness, getting involved in the advocacy space, passing policies and legislation on the issue. And we're actually part of an international network and our, we have offices in 94 countries. All right. And so uh, normally when we start the show, we kind of do a little softball on how people got involved in the event industry. Uh, since you're not directly in the event <laughs> industry, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you got involved with ECPAT. Yeah, I mean, it's been a while now. So, um, so I first started as actually an intern when I was in grad school. I was originally before grad school, I was working in Albany, New York in refugee resettlement. And I was helping every single day to help put people into homes who were resettling into the United States and helping get them jobs and resources. And when I was thinking about going to grad school, I thought, you know, I'm doing this work that feels like I'm plugging up a hole and I need to work on the top level. I need to do policy work because it feels like I can just do this forever. And when I was in grad school, I learned about human trafficking. I learned about child trafficking, and I learned that it was happening here in the United States. It was happening to girls in the neighborhoods where everyone grows up, where everyone was. I really felt like this could have been me at any point. It really could be anyone's children, and it could have been the na my neighbors. And so I felt like it was something that I couldn't not do. It was interesting. I was just, I think like a lot of people that now that I meet and hear about the issue, I felt very similarly. This is so big. This is so unbelievable and wrong. And it's the biggest violation of human rights and freedom. And so I needed to do the work and I needed to stop it. And when I interned at Expat USA, I was right away focused on business engagement, corporate engagement. We had two partners that we were working with and that was it. And so my job was, <laughs> my boss was like, figure out why, you know, why we don't have more partners and how can we change that? And so started from there and almost 10 years later now, we partner with almost every major hotel chain two of the major airlines, domestic airlines, and we've really grown our, our mission and our engagement with the travel industry and the meeting and events industry to, to make a big difference. So it, it, it really spoke to me. So, I mean, there, there, there's quite a few different organizations that, that are working to, to help solve this problem. How is mm -hmm. it that ECPAT became involved specifically with the meeting and events industry? It's a great question. So, we have a focus that I think is very unique to the nonprofit space and especially the human tra anti trafficking, anti child trafficking space, in that we engage directly with businesses. So, my role is the director of private sector engagement. And so, I manage all of our 
positioning and our programs to work to develop resources, policies, and tools to support the private sector. When ECPAT was, you know, initiating its work in in the 90s, we were we originally were created because groups in developing countries were realizing that travelers, that tourists were going over to developing countries from Western countries and exploiting local children. And so ECPAT has never not worked with the tourism industry and the travel industry. And then, in, then we developed a set of guidelines for businesses. So with the input of the travel industry, we developed a set of six guidelines. It's called the code. The code. And it helps companies put in place policies, training, and programs to address the issue comprehensively. So what is your policy? Do you have a policy against human trafficking, child exploitation? Are you training your employees? Are you training people who go on tours or in hotels to identify and report the issue? You know, it's, it's comprehensive. So there's six steps. And this was becoming more common. It was becoming best practice, basically, that hotels and airlines were getting involved. And then we were realizing that there's space for the meeting and events industry because they're positioned to speak to the suppliers every single day. So it was interesting when we first started working with the meeting and events industry, it was because a group of nuns <laughs> were booking a conference at a hotel in St. Louis, Missouri. And they asked their meeting planner to book their hotel, their hotel and their conference at a hotel that had signed the code that had was an expat partner. And the meeting planner was like, what? You know, what are you talking about? Human trafficking? I've seen the movie Taken, that doesn't happen here. And that was the first time that they, Nick's conference and meeting management, had heard about this issue. And they asked the hotel and they asked us, what's going on? And so they were the first meeting and events company to take action on this issue and we worked with them to develop you know to adopt the code so that it fits their structure and they were the first meeting and events company to join our program and to implement the code and it was the first time that we had realized that there's a space where this industry while in the travel industry but also parallel has more access than most to travel suppliers and so that was our entree and since since then we've been I think that was in 2012 so now 2019 we've been working really closely with meeting and events companies travel management companies and corporate travel managers to to ask those questions you know of their suppliers are you engaged on this issue do you have policies do you have training and here's what you can do and we definitely want to get into, obviously, the concrete steps that people can start to do. Before we do that, though, uh, first, I want to remind everybody who might be watching live to please uh, feel free to join us on the chat roll at event-icons.com. Um, and uh, you can drop your questions for Michelle in there as we go along. Please feel free to join in the conversation, have your own side conversation about, uh, about this topic. Um, you know, you started to touch on there in the intro that you know, this is occurring on a lot of different levels in a lot of different ways. So let's kind of zoom out to the 10,000 foot level and uh, talk about kind of the scope of, of mm -hmm. you know, of, of child sex trafficking and, you know, how all the different avenues, because you, like you said, sometimes it's people traveling to countries. Sometimes it's people mm -hmm. being moved from country to country. Sometimes it's people from down the block, you know, that mm -hmm. sometimes a lot of times, I think that stereotype has gotten to be a little less... Uh, in recent years, I think people are becoming more aware that sex trafficking is going on like here in the U.S. from people down the block. I think that's right. more public than it used to be. But I think there's still a little bit of that. Um, and maybe this is just my uh, misperception. Still a little bit of that, uh, uh, well, ignorance, for lack of a better word, that this is happening somewhere off in another foreign country. So let's take it out to the 10-foot level and um, tell us a little bit about the scope of this issue. Yeah, I mean, it's so hard because you say ignorance, but really it's just what we're, what we're shown, what we're taught. We're taught through media that this is happening overseas or it's only happening in cities or, you know, it happens like it happens in the movie Taken or that victims have to be kidnapped. Or one of the biggest misconceptions is that victims have to be moved across a border or somewhere to be considered a human trafficking victim. But that's not necessary. By law, it's really the 
exploitation and then another person getting the financial benefits of that that makes the victim uh, the person a victim of trafficking so it's this control over a person for exploitation in which they receive money you don't have to go anywhere now people do you know they do move their victims from city to city when there's demand or um, you know, if law enforcement is on to them, for example, or if they want to grow their business, sadly, to say it like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we only think that the person has to cross the border, then we're not really looking properly at the issue. I think a lot of people also believe that victims are, you know, chained or tied up, but often there's actually just mental control that's happening. And a victim just looks like anyone and they might show indicators which we'll talk we could talk about later but you know they it, there's there's kids that we've worked with that still go to school um our youth outreach manager has had victim self-identify at the schools that she's working in now a child any child by u.s law who's in the commercial sex industry is automatically a victim of sex trafficking by law so they're they're automatically victims and not criminals and they need to be afforded services when we speak globally about the issue i mean i don't want to scare anyone with numbers but you know the international labor labor organization estimates that over 40 um, million people are living in trafficking worldwide and one out of four of those victims are children so you know this is a an urgent issue and what we also know is that this is a 150 billion dollar crime so it's 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 a big business it's an illicit business but it's huge and then another thing is that you know you think that it's not happening in your state or city but human trafficking has been reported in all 50 states so there isn't one state that is immune to this it happens in cities it happens in suburbs we've had hotels that have reported this in the smallest towns I've ever passed through and the biggest cities that we've ever been in. So it's, it's just a matter of looking for this issue. If you're looking for this issue, um, if law enforcement is focusing on that, they will find it. Do you have some more, uh, more international numbers you might be able to throw us? No, I think that's okay. the last one that we have, but we do know that trafficking, like I said, it's a multi-billion dollar crime I think that what we do realize is that it's becoming more lucrative because stolen goods, drugs, and guns can be sold only one time, but people can be sold over and over again. And so that's why we focus on this issue. And that's why it's so important that law enforcement focuses on it, the travel industry, the meeting and events industry, it's so important that it's a multi-stakeholder, multi-sector approach to addressing it. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, it's it's big business and it's big business all mm -hmm. over the world. And again, it's not just confined to one, you know, tiny corner in the world. You know, we, it's not some third world country. Like you say, anytime there's money being exchanged, uh, you know, that, that that's trafficking. Yeah, it's not taking people across the border or, you know, on an airplane or anything like that. So, um, let's get into uh, some of the specifics about how the meeting and events industry um, uh, is involved uh, just ex by existing. And so, I mean, let's take it, take it from that before we get, again get into the, you know, the things that we can do about it. You know, how, how is it that, you know, hotel is involved, travel is involved, all of these things, uh, you know, how is the industry involved in sex trafficking? Well, what we have found is that the meeting and events industry role is to raise awareness with both clients and suppliers. So the way that they can, as you, you've written in the description, slow down trafficking is pretty much by raising awareness about it. So it's that because the facilities that your, that the listeners, that the viewers are using to you know, have these amazing extravagant or, you know, quick events are being used by traffickers. It's really in their best interest from a risk management approach, but also because it's the right thing to do to engage the hotels that they work with, that the suppliers that they work with about this issue. We also know that the meeting and events industry just is a business of people that travel all the time. So 
hotel, so meeting and event professionals have a role in identifying trafficking in travel. So knowing the signs can really make a huge difference, which we could talk about as well. And then lastly is the products that you're using every day in events can be in some way associated with trafficking through the supply chain. So are you, is the industry doing its due diligence in ensuring that the products aren't used or that they're going as far down in the supply chain or ensuring that as many products that they're using in their events are trafficking free? Well, we've got a few people that are starting to uh, chat, uh, both on Facebook and in the chat room. And so, first of all, we've got Nick Borelli, who's a frequent friend of the show uh, on Facebook. Uh, he actually learned about your mission from David Peckinpah at uh, PCMA mm-hmm. Convening Leaders just this week. <laughs> so he uh, he was a shout out from uh, Nick. And then Elizabeth Glau would like to say hi, Michelle, as well. So, oh, I love Elizabeth. You definitely That's know. funny. <laughs> I know your viewers. You know some (laughs) folks, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so PCMA just recently, just this week, announced that they're partnering with us to, they've joined the code. And so their mission, I mean, the mission for associations really is to educate as many people as possible on this issue. So we see associations as multipliers of engagement on this issue, putting this issue into conferences. So we've had, we also see the role of the meeting and events industry to get as many eyes and ears on this issue as possible. So who better to host sessions on this than the people planning those events? (laughs) So it's something you can always talk about. So you've mentioned it a couple of times now, and uh, so tell me more about the code, both as it originally started out, and then Mm -hmm. how it evolved and has changed over the course of time to be more specific to meeting and event planners. So the code has gone through quite its journey. It was developed, as I said, I think I'm not sure I mentioned, but it was developed in 2004. So it's been a while. Um, It was developed initially with the understanding that tour operators would be using it. So think about, so think about how far it's come from tour operators to global hotel games. Um, So it was developed with the understanding, like I said, so expat's original mission was to help kids who were being exploited by travelers in developing countries. So that was the main focus. There was never an intention that it would be implemented in Western countries um, in the sending countries was the mindset for a long time. So it, originally, so thinking tour operators, that was how the six steps were initiated. The first step to develop a policy and then adopt that policy. So having a policy against this issue to, and it tells your employees, we care about this issue. Our company cares about this issue and we want you to do the right thing. Your company also has to have a procedure on the issue. So if your associates or if your employees do see something, do they know exactly what to do? So those two steps are very important. Then the second step is to train associates. So train your employees on the issue, on how they can get involved, what it looks like, and how what they should do if they see something. So they know it's important to you now. They know what it looks like. They know how to do it, and they know that you support them engaging on this issue and doing something about it. Then you've got your employees covered. From a policy level, you also have a policy on this issue. The third step is to include a clause in contracts with suppliers. Originally, the goal was, you know, you're a tour operator, you have contracts with hotels, you have contracts with taxi companies, and so what it would do was to let your taxi companies know that if your travelers were staying at their hotel and might be sexually exploiting children in some way, that that's absolutely not okay with your business and that they should, you know, care about this as well. So it was almost like a way to continue the movement forward, to keep it going. So alerting companies, other companies through your contracts. The fourth step is to engage stakeholders. So it's almost like, let's not keep this to yourself. You can't do this alone. When we think of a stakeholder, originally we were thinking these are NGOs in the develop in the destination country. So if you if your you know tour operators see something, can they report it to an NGO? Can they report it to the right hotline? Do they know how to do that? And so that was the stakeholders we were thinking of. 
And then, as I imagine, depending on where you are, that could be completely different. I mean, it could be right. depending on what part of what corner of the world you're in. Yeah. And so a company that knows that they travel a lot in Thailand should have a process for reporting trafficking to an NGO and a hotline in Thailand. If you travel a lot in Mexico, that's going to look different. It's a completely different non-governmental organization. It might be a different reporting hotline. It probably is. The government infrastructure looks different. The laws look different in each country. So the company has to do their due diligence in understanding what the reporting protocol is so that their employees, if they do report it, they're calling the right people. And then they know that if they call again, it's the right thing and it works. So that's important to keep employees continuously engaged, but also to have the right response. And then companies pat beyond that, they have to inform their customers in some way. So imagine tour operators, it's the travelers that are going on these tours. Do they know what the hotline is if they see something? Um, and do they know that this is a zero tolerance tour operator? And then the last thing companies do is they report annually every year. That's the last step. So the companies report on all of the implementation they've done. And what we're able to do is gain best practice information to get companies to share what they're doing so that we can grow our engagement. And it's also a method for getting data, you know? Now, originally tour operators, that there was really not a full understanding of how even a global hotel chain would implement the step. The good thing about the code though, is that it's customizable. So each company, because the corporate culture of every company is different, the structure of every business is different, it looks a little different. So while when we started engaging with the meeting and events industry, we had to adjust and adopt, adapt the steps to fit the new structure. You know, what I thought was interesting was at the same time we were engaging with um, a global distributing system. <laughs> and so that looks so different than a hotel or tour operator. And so every, think about this, every single type of industry is doing work on this issue, but a little bit differently. So now when we think about the meeting and events industry today, and I think, you know, because this is a, <laughs> a podcast for the meeting and events industry, I would say that the main focus is on the third step, so the clauses and contracts, and and that's kind of what we're, we ask meeting and event companies to do, and the training step. So are you training your employees? Are you training your travelers to identify trafficking and know how to talk about this issue? And then are you putting it in contracts? Because that is a huge, huge way to influence the industry. And that was the main focus and the biggest, I would say, what really took us to the next level in engagement and grew a lot of awareness on the ground level. Because before that, you know, a po on a policy level, a company like, you know, a big, a big major hotel chain might sign and join the code. But getting that information down to the franchise level isn't so easy. And so if you put it in your contracts, then that hotel property will learn about it. So it's, it has a really great and big impact. Well, I love the way that that kind of, like you say, it's in, in, in a way paying it forward. It's, 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 it's mm -hmm. raising awareness. It's filtering down. You can see how that web, because even if you're um, – uh, you know, even if those contracts are just getting, going out to to different vendors at different times and things like that, you can see it just, you can imagine it quite clearly spreading from vendor to vendor to vendor to vendor. Um, let's, uh, you know, start getting into, uh, I think it's step two, please correct me, uh, where we're, we're identifying. Um, so let's start to now, uh, as meeting and events uh, folk, how do we start to identify uh, when we're seeing potential trafficking going on? Right. So, yes, training. So, when we're traveling, what we did at Expat USA is we put together a list of indicators that you might see when you're traveling. And any traveler can use this information, but of course, in the meeting and events industry, you're probably traveling a little bit more. So, some of the indicators that we've included, though, you know, this could, it's very easy to explain some of these things. Like, 
minimal luggage or clothing. So if you've lost your luggage from going from one destination to another, that can absolutely happen. And you could also look like disheveled or like you've been traveling for a long time. So though those two indicators are two indicators of trafficking, they might not, you know, it might not be trafficking. We also acknowledge that a lack of access to travel documents or money is an indicator of trafficking. So the trafficker might be holding on to that information and so the victim doesn't have access to that and it's used as leverage against the victim or a means of control. So they have to constantly be asking for it. A victim will seem disoriented or lost. They might not even know what destination they're in or where they're going. So asking, how are you? Oh, you know, asking questions. We've had hotel associates who just say, how are you? And then a trafficking victim will give an additional indicator. And that's how you'll, they'll decide to escalate a situation. So an, a victim that has lack of adequate language skills, if, they're, if they are in fact a foreign victim, if you're seeing one person, the trafficker with many young children, and they insist on paying solely in cash, those are some of the indicators. Uh, oftentimes, a trafficker and a victim are, are ha try to have minimal interaction or eye contact with others. And we've seen situations on flights where uh, victims are not you know, speaking for themselves, traffickers speaking for them, they seem panicked or confused and they won't know what to do. And so that's when a flight attendant will realize, okay, let me just ask, oh, so where are you headed? And then might hear the trafficker say one destination, the victim say another. So now there's an inconsistency in a story. No evidence of a return ticket or having multiple tickets tickets to multiple destinations. So recently, this past year, we had a situation where a gate agent named Denise Miracle from Sacramento, California, uh, she's a gate agent with American Airlines, who's a partner of ours, was, you know, just doing a regular, regular work day and had two girls come up and try to check in. And she realized that they had, they didn't have a return ticket and their ticket was bought with a fraudulent credit card. So she thinks, okay, this is odd. Two girls, they're underage. She asks them if their parents know where they're going. They said no. And she asked who bought them their tickets. She ended up finding out that a guy that they had met on Instagram bought their tickets. Mm -hmm. And they were traveling from Sacramento to New York City to become models. And of course, this, <laughs> you know, put off all the bells in her head. Yeah. So what, yeah, right. So she ended up calling the local law enforcement and they actually got the guy on the phone, this Instagram person. And he ended up hanging up the phone, realizing it was law enforcement and immediately deleted the, the account. <laughs> so those two girls were about to go to New York City and this, a woman who just asked, you know, one more question, decided to check that case, prevented trafficking, and it was sort of this no return ticket, um, fraudulent credit card, things that made her feel weird, and she was just said it, there was something that told me that this is wrong. And then we, yeah, so we see a lot of indicators, and and it's a it's a compilation of things that put something together that makes you makes you second guess it. Well, and that's what's sinking in for me is I think I think sometimes people are hesitant to say something or do something because like you said, a lot of those scenarios that you described are ones that either we've been in ourselves or, you know, or can easily imagine, right? Where like, well, okay, uh, someone's got control of the passports and money. That could be a parent. I know I would, I would, you know, I would be in charge of my kids' passports and money, um, mm -hmm. you know, up to a certain age, I'm sure. And, um, you know, but I think the key there, uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, then is to say, okay, if someone something, if you see some of these indicators, especially if there's more than one, um, to just say something, you know, and to, to ask that one more question, like you say, you know, just, just a simple, hey, how are you? You know, yep. and then how that goes can be another indicator um, before you go running off to police and say, you know, hey, I think this is a potential sex trafficker over here. Am right, I, kind of, exactly. am I kind of judging that right? Exactly. So if you're on a flight and you see something, you might just mention it to the flight attendant and then she'll go through her protocol because yeah. for us, we are making sure that the front line is trained, 
And now we're moving beyond the front line to ensure that meeting and events professionals are trained, business travelers are trained, the average traveler is trained would be a great, great thing that we would love to see. And so it's what you're supposed to do is just mention it to the flight attendant when you're, uh, if you're at an airport, mention it to security if you see something, and then they can check the ticket. They'll see, is there no return ticket? They've also have indicators to look for. Um, if you're at a hotel, just mention it to the front desk. I've worked with hotels that will run reports every month, every night, and if they see a room that's being booked every single day, one day after another, or and or paid for in cash every single day, then they'll kind of flag it. It'll be something that they look at. They'll check that room. If the room has the, you know, the um, do not disturb uh, sign on it, then they'll, again, that's another thing they're looking at. If, if they see that a lot and other indicators, like for hotels we have, if they're asking for an excess of towels and sheets, that's a huge indicator. If they see credit cards that are prepaid credit cards in the garbage, huge indicator. And so those, big indicators put together with let's say you decide to report that the the room next door kept opening and closing on regular hours in the middle of the night then they have enough to go on for them to maybe call law enforcement so it's it's a lot of people doing a lot of things and working together as a collective community to just just say something yeah, and you don't have to be panicky about it, I imagine. You can just be like, hey, it's probably nothing, but mm -hmm. I saw this. And then maybe the, your one thing that you saw matches up with one thing that somebody else saw, or like you said, some other indicators from the hotel or something along those lines. Uh, Elizabeth, back on Facebook, um, uh, brings up another good point that, again, I keep what keeps kind of continuing to blow my mind is the, the different angles, that, that this comes from so many different angles. And this was one that I hadn't thought of and, we, and hadn't come up yet, um, that there are conferences that attract the traffickers because of the demographics of that conference, unfortunately contain a lot of potential buyers. How do we talk about this considering it's such a sensitive subject? So that was an angle that I hadn't even thought about that, you know, that they would be traffic, you know, offering these services to the attendees of your conference because of the demographics. So, it is a sensitive subject and and you know what you know what would those conferences be and what can we as meeting planners do again to uh try and reduce the likelihood that our attendees are being targeted with the services not targeted as you know traffic yeah absolutely teams. absolutely yeah so um i mean elizabeth makes an amazing point mm -hmm. One thing, I, the code has been around for a long time. People have been working on this issue for a long time. One thing that we realize hasn't changed is that people still feel that traveling, be, being a traveler, being in a travel space like a hotel or an airline, you feel anonymous. And that increases the risk of becoming a buyer. So when you're traveling, you're in a hotel, you feel like it's a risk-free environment, like no one's watching you. And yes, it's absolutely true that there are situations when people are out of town and they feel like they can do whatever they want. They think engaging in this is victimless, it's fine. And so one way that if you're a meeting planner and you're working on a conference that feels like it's a risky conference is you can bring up this issue as a risk management problem. So trafficking brings in a lot of other crimes. It in and of itself brings a lot of violence with it, gun trafficking, a drug trafficking. And so speaking with a risk management approach, so mentioning to the, the conference, the person who is booking the conference with you, that this is an issue that your company works on and you do it because it's risk management, you do it because it's the right thing. It's a great approach to, you know, if they're not interested right away to getting them to care about it. And I'd love to know more about, you know, specifically the demographics. I'm I mean, I'm assuming, and maybe please correct me, Michelle, if I'm wrong, that, that the, the demographics that we're talking about are probably older white rich men would be my guess of who would be the most likely to be targeted by traffickers. Um, so if we're looking at assuming she's talking about a conference of those particular people, would that be semi-accurate to say? I mean, uh, sadly, I'm okay saying that. if you don't want to say that, I'm okay. I mean, as, as it's a, really men, like period. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it's really men period. Yeah. Because it's it's been you you'd be surprised. It's it's twenty year olds. It's it's sixty year olds. So it's really it's it's everyone. It's pretty wild well, when we see the arrest. But but basically dudes. Not age specific, but basically dudes. Yeah, yeah. well put. <laughs> yep. I'm 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 happy to say, not happy to say that's not the right, the right word, but um I, I'm certainly gonna. Uh, say that that seems to be yeah. the case. So, so yeah, uh, boys will be boys attitude. Think, yeah, it shows, yeah, that, that help. shows that attract mainly men. And like you mm-hmm. say, away, you know, away from home, maybe in a foreign country or something along those lines. Uh, the temptation, maybe, you know, maybe that person would never think about it in their daily life, but um, the temptation might be there. So, so you said to I me, mean, maybe we can bring it up as a risk management subject, as you know, on the planning side of like, hey, we we've got a uh, trade show of mainly men in uh, Thailand. And, um, you know, we need to have this discussion of, you know, how do we make sure that we're keeping an eye on our own attendees to make sure that nobody's uh, going down the wrong path? Is that kind of what we're talking about? Yeah, or maybe you'd want to do um, just an awareness card. You might put out, you know, information about how the hotel is trained. Just letting them know this hotel, this yeah. conference is not anonymous, is not risk free. I mean, of course, you could be, you could explicitly say it. Do not buy sex with children. Right. You can do yeah. that. Or you could be subtle. You could just right. let them know you're, it's not safe to do that here. And it's not, it's the wrong thing to do. And our company is against that. Right. And if it's, and if it's a, you know, a single organization, obviously it's a lot easier. We see that all the time where you don't get into specifics. You just say, Hey, you're here on behalf of the company. We expect you to behave in a way that is respectful to, you know, both yourselves and the locals um, and, right. and hotel employees and things like that. We see those kinds of messages all the time. You bring up a fantastic point that I wanted to get into, um, which is uh, especially kind of in the wake of feels to me in the wake of, of the Las Vegas shooting uh, incidents that I'm certainly seeing as I travel more, more of these little kind of cards that are in the room mm-hmm. that say something to the effect of, you know, we want to respect your privacy, but we reserve the right to come into your room, even if you have the do not disturb, uh, you know, sign on the door. Um, and I know from, you know, some of the other you know, previous sessions that I've seen in the past on this subject, that that can be an indicator as well, where you've got a do not disturb that's on, you know, all the time. Now, again, that's one of those things that like, that's what I do. You know, I do that all the time when I'm traveling. Okay. So you can see that kernel of, you know, you don't want to worry about these things. Um, so the question that I have is, and maybe this isn't one that you can answer, but maybe you can, is how effective do you feel things like that are? You know, is it effective from just a mental standpoint of making the someone stop and think, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't do anything illegal, whatever, whatever that might be? Um, or do you think hotels are actually starting to take a more aggressive stand when it comes to, you know, letting themselves into rooms that have do not disturbs on. I don't know if you know that or not. I'm just curious. We do definitely have hotels who use that approach to managing their risk. So another thing that we created was is a checklist of different ways that a hotel on the, on a very practical level can put in place measures to prevent their hotel from being used. And one of them is to ensure that you're checking a room every, at least once a day. We had that, we've had that recommendation for, I think over five years. So it's not, this isn't a new thing. I do think that what we're seeing is more legislative mandates towards hotels. So it's possible you're seeing signage because it's actually legally mandated that a hotel puts up that signage or they're doing it voluntarily because it's, becoming trendier. I, you know, I know that trafficking exists within the travel space and will continue to exist because traffickers feel that the hotel industry is anonymous and it's risk-free. The longer they feel that way, the longer they'll use it. They'll use it. If your hotel doesn't feel anonymous, but the one next door does, they'll just go from that hotel to the next to the next that's why it has to be an industry-wide initiative there's no hotel that's immune to this now these signs while they might seem dramatic or 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 like they're not going to help at all 
can help create an environment where someone feels that it's not anonymous and it's not risk free. So it can decrease demand, can make a trafficker feel a little more uncomfortable. If it's not, if I don't feel completely comfortable here, I'm leaving. You know, it's not worth the risk. So that's a big important point to make. But if a trafficker doesn't consider themselves a trafficker, they don't use that language, then that's not going to prevent it. And if a buyer doesn't consider the victim a trafficking victim, they think of them another way, and they might not be a trafficking victim, then it's also not going to change their behavior. So that's, to be candid, that's how that would work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and But I mean, like you say, at least, uh, you know, at least if there's some hesitation or to make someone just think, right. you know, that every little bit helps. And I think that's one of the key takeaways that we wanted folks uh, to, to have uh, with today's show is that, you know, and, and I've heard some some folks in our industry say, look, this isn't a problem that our industry can solve. Okay, fair enough. No. We, mm-hmm. our industry can't solve this issue, but if all of us do a little bit, you know, and if like uh, putting it in contracts, having the code, education, looking for the warning signs, all of the things that are in the code, you know, are going to help us do a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And maybe that's one person that gets saved or 10 people or 15. It doesn't matter how few, but you know, if we're all doing a little bit, that's going to certainly help and be better than doing nothing at all. Um, absolutely, I, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, um, I had a conversation with a survivor of trafficking one time and we were talking about the code. And in fact, she lived in a hotel at one point in her life as a child. And that's how she was recruited. Um, her trafficker saw her at her home, the hotel. Mm-hmm. And talking to her and talking about the code and her work now, she had said to me, um, if the code had existed when I was a kid, I really think my life would have been different. So, you know, it does, just knowing that hoteliers can be trained was enough for her knowing how often she was in hotels to know that it could have, it would have, because she was in so many hotels, it would have made a difference. Absolutely. And it's, it's, that's one of my personal frustrations. And so I'm sorry if it came out a little bit there, but it's, is, is that this idea that because we can't solve a problem, we can't do anything about it. And so that's, that's, that's something that always frustrates me. So I want to, we've still, we've got about 15 minutes left and I feel like we've touched on a lot of the things that I wanted to make sure we touched on, but I want to make sure we've got time for any other specific tips uh, for meeting planners that you want to get through and then any other specific tips for just us as regular travelers. So I know, like I said, I know we've kind of touched on a lot of them. So I just want to make sure we've got some room here just in case we miss some. Yeah, I think that one thing that maybe I didn't explicitly say was that meeting planners, meeting planner companies, travel management companies can implement and adopt their own policies against human trafficking. So what that does just like in any other business is let your associates know that you support them in their engagement on this issue because this is an issue that is very unique to the travel industry and so this is one that anyone who works in the travel industry really should be working on so having that policy for the meeting and events industry is very important we are also seeing more companies adopt policies in their employee handbook that have zero tolerance towards trafficking and exploitation. Again, just sends that message just as a a potential buyer of trafficking to let them know, maybe think twice about this. (laughs) Um, Training, very important. That is a huge thing that that, uh, the meeting and events industry can do. Training on what it looks like, what what you want your team to do if they see something, training on how you would want them to communicate this issue to buyers and to their clients, and then training on how and what you want them to say to suppliers. Those are, that's the important components of training. And then we're seeing, we love seeing meeting and event planners put this issue on the agenda. So having a session on it, um, I've spoken at MPI before, at meeting and events conferences, but really you can talk about this topic anywhere. It's a great CSR topic. It's a great human rights topic. It's a give, we've seen meeting and events companies 
do give backs on this issue. So it's a it, it's it's not the easiest topic, and I know it's not the feel good topic of the year, but people feel really good when they work on this issue. So it's a it's a great give back session, a great CSR session. Um, I talked about the the um, the putting language in contracts. So adding language, adding easy questions to RFPs. So does does your does this company have a human trafficking policy? Does this company train on the issue? Um, can you do you have a response protocol? Can mm -hmm. you paraphrase what that contract language would sound like? I not not the specifics of it, but just roughly, what would that kind of contract language sound like? So it's 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 usually usually suggestive. So it's a, a easy question. So does your company have a policy against? human trafficking and the commercial sexual exploitation, yes or no? Does your company train, require training for your employees on human trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation, yes or no? Does your company ensure that the products in your hotel are free from labor exploitation, yes or no? And then they choose, is your company a member of expats tourism child protection code of conduct, yes or no? And then what the client can then do is decide, do I want to show preference to this? Do I not want to? And the meeting and events company can also share information with the supplier. So here's how you can get involved. Visit the Expat USA website or reach out to your brand for resources. So a lot of the major hotel chains already have training available. The property just has to take it. And, and how and about then, in the contract? Would it be something along the lines of you agree to adhere to the code of con something along those lines? It, yeah, it says, um, as a responsible business, I agree to, I believe that human trafficking, I have a zero tolerance policy towards human trafficking and child exploitation, or as a, as a member of the Tourism Child Protection Code, I am involved in implementing these six steps. So we, ha we actually have suggested RFP language and suggested clause language on our website that anyone can access at any time. And is, has, it's so effective. I've been to conferences where, um, where I'll speak and then a hotel comes up to me and is like, I've seen that language before. So it, it really does work. And we'll be and sure then, to put we'll be sure to put that website in in the show resources. But for those of us who are those who are listening, um, and maybe haven't read the read through the show description or anything, that's e c is in cat p a t dot org ecpat. So we've been saying ecpat. Oh, it's ecpat usa. Uh, USA. ecpat usa dot usa. Okay, ecpat usa dot yeah. org. I will change that yeah. right now in my notes. Yeah. Make sure we get the right one uh, in in the show notes. So ecpat usa e c p a t usa org, um, where you can get that language and find out more yeah. resources. Um, so uh, wrapping up here a little bit, any other tips that you've got specifically for meeting planners or should we move on to uh, the, just the frequent travelers and all of us? I mean, I think just last tip would be that I know that during events, a lot of meeting planners give a gift to speakers for speaking. And what I've seen, which I thought was really amazing, was at an event where they were highlighting us in our issue. Instead of giving a gift, they gave a donation to Expat USA and gave a note card to every speaker about the issue, about why they're involved, and that they had given, you know, $5 on your behalf, which were $20 and it adds up. So I thought that that was a really wonderful and easy way to give a little more and almost invest in the cause too as well. Excellent. So we want to remind everybody as we wrap up here, this is your last chance to get in questions. If you want to throw them in the chat roll or throw them into the uh, uh, comments on Facebook, we'll be happy to pass those on. Um, so if you uh, let's so let's move on to the frequent travelers. Uh, any other any other tips for those of us that are frequent frequent travelers? We talked a little bit about some of the things to look out for. Well, so you're a frequent traveler. I mean, I think we don't ask questions as much as we should. So when you're checking in at the hotel, are you asking if they're trained? Are you asking if they have policies on this issue? Just, I travel here. You know, there's social media. So if you're sharing on social media, I've seen travelers who will tweet at a company. Companies are watching this information. If you go to the headquarters of any of the brands, they have entire rooms for social media, their social media teams, and they, sh they have all of the tweets that come up. So 
if they're seeing that you're traveling with their company because they care about human rights, they care about important issues, then they'll put a little more focus on it. So that's incredibly important. Then I think we often forget that we don't talk about human trafficking in our everyday lives. So one thing that I would say just as not a traveler, but you know, as a parent or sister or cousin of someone, are you talking to kids about this issue? Because if we're not, then traffickers are talking to them. They're using social media to do it. They're using the same platforms, Twitter to reach out to kids, Facebook to reach out to quit kids. So if we're not talking to children, if we're not managing the message of healthy relationships and online safety, then traffickers will will take advantage of that platform, those platforms as well, and reach the children in our communities. So talk about this issue. I think that's an incredibly important point. We're not talking about, you know, panel vans next to playgrounds. It's, you know, they're, they're incredibly sophisticated, uh, you know, on on how how they, you know, get a hold of kids. It's it's not, you know, not no, just it's, it's, up the sidewalk. Like you said, it's not. Instagram and Facebook and things like that. It's sending 300 messages and getting one back, and that's worth it for them. It's it's realizing, you know, this this kid is liking this page, so let me talk about this. It's it's not it's not hard to target a kid anymore. You know, we there's so much information on social media. Oh, well, I mean, again, I keep being Sorry. just kind of no, Sorry. I keep no, I keep being blown away by the number of angles on this thing, right? Right, and, and that's why I think, unfortunately, some people get so daunted by these types of situations. And that's again, you know, we don't have to do everything; we just have to do one thing. And so, no, that's another right. angle is is is, is mm-hmm. parents posting their kids' information online inadvertently, or you know, you know, just not not thinking through social media. And here's my picture of my kids, and here's their names, mm-hmm. and all that kind of. And it's so and so's birthday, and you know, I try to be a little sensitive about that stuff but even still you find yourself because it's a pretty picture of your kid's birthday and you want to post it on stuff i mean there's there's safe ways to do it i wouldn't i wouldn't stop doing that your family wants to see that but i think you know teaching your kid about not opening random messages is very important and then big stuff Right. And, 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 and so many different businesses are involved in this issue. We, we are seeing the tech industry, we're seeing financial institutions step up, the travel industry, meeting and events industry. It's multi-sector. Everyone has to do something though. So there's, there's plenty that all of us can do both as a meeting planner, as the event industry, vendors in the event industry, um, as frequent travelers, frequent flyers. We've discussed a lot of those things. Do you have kind of one mega tip, the one tip that, you know, would you would leave uh, the, the planners that are in our audience? Talk about this issue. Talk okay. about it at your events. Yeah. I know meeting planners love to talk, so don't stop talking about this issue. It's not something that you just talk about during Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Month or the day your company implements their training, but at every meeting, at every event. And Elizabeth brings up another uh, important angle, which is as as speakers, uh, as we're traveling around, we need to be able to keep these things in mind uh, as well, and spreading that information among speakers, like you said, with the the gifts and things like that, is going to get that yeah. information out. Um, so, well, fantastic information! Thank you so much for discussing this incredibly important topic uh, with us today. Um, uh, we want to make sure that we've got the resources. You know, you talked about making sure you know part of the code is is having the resources. So obviously. Uh, uh, expatusa.org is going to be one of the big resources. Uh, do you have any more off the top of your head that you're willing to share as far as, hey, you know, see something, say something type resources? Obviously, uh, front desk, uh, law enforcement and things like that. But beyond that, more, more you know, kind of higher level organizations. I almost forgot. So today we actually launched a training that focuses on the meeting and events industry that takes us beyond the front line. So beyond the front desk into the meeting and events industry, into third party professionals. And it is exactly the training that I talked about. So it teaches meeting and events professionals about how to identify the issue, how to respond to it. We talked about how to respond to it in travel, how to have conversations with your clients about the issue, uh, your corporate clients, your church clients, your school clients, your wedding clients how to talk and then how to talk about the issue with suppliers so it's 
exactly the training that everyone on this who is checking out this uh, podcast needs. And it is also available on our website at expatusa.org. So Fantastic. anyone can access it. And I want to throw one more out there, which is one of the first organizations that I heard about. And um, uh, there was a woman speaking at one of the conferences that I was at from an organization called love146.org, which is another uh, organization dedicated to the abolition of child trafficking and exploitation. So I just want to kind of throw uh, a mention for them as well as another uh, nonprofit that's looking into this. That is a, a fascinating and sad, sad story. Um, uh, uh, if you want to, if someone wants to check that out as well, uh, as far as how that organization got their name and the story behind uh, how it was created is uh, a, a tragic story, but also one that is, inspires you to, again, do something about it, um, which is why the, the organization was created. So uh, love146.org is for that. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it, uh, Michelle, if there's more uh, that people wanted to find out, obviously, expatusa.org. Uh, are you on any of the social media sites or anything? like that? Is there any place you would like people to follow you? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter. I'm at Michelle Gelb, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-G-U-E-L-B. All right, fantastic. So I encourage you folks uh, out there to uh, follow Michelle and get more information uh, as far as what she's up to. So thank you again so much for joining us. We want to thank you all for joining us as well. Steve, Lori, Katrina, Elizabeth, Nick joining us uh, both on Facebook and in the chat roll. Uh, so many people, so many great conversations going on there. I didn't get a chance to get everything in uh, as we went along. Uh, we want to remind all of you that Event Icons is recorded live each Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you can watch behind the scenes on Facebook Live, or you can join us right there at event-icons.com, where you get it all in one nice page. You can sign up right away and start watching right away there. Um, you've got the chat roll over on the side. You've got the video embedded in the page. That really is the best way uh, to join us live. So you can sign up at event-icons.com. You can watch us. You can participate in the chat there. Uh, otherwise, the show is recorded and released the following Tuesday on iTunes, Pocket Cast, Stitcher, or wherever you get your favorite, uh, whatever your favorite po po uh, podcast app is. Um, uh, we want to know what you think. So be sure and use the hashtag event icons on Twitter. Uh, join the Event Icons Facebook group. We're starting to get the LinkedIn group off the ground. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you on whatever social network uh, you want to be on. We want to be there as well. Let us know what icons of the industry you want to be on the show. Uh, if there's someone you're dying to see, at an event you're dying to find out more about, let us know that as well. So thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time on Event Icons. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the social conversation. Sponsored by Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with Hashtag Event Icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on hashtag event icons.